I can't see you out there, but I know you're there. Uh, my name is Tom Baldwin. I want to welcome you all uh, to this lecture. Uh, I'm the Dean of the College of Natural Agricultural Sciences. I'm a new guy uh, here in town. I came to Riverside last summer. Uh, and one of the things that's just been amazingly fun to me is to get to walk around and talk to the faculty on this campus. We have some absolutely amazing faculty doing truly extraordinary science. And the, it's been so much fun to me that it seems it's something we re should really share with the community. Science really is fun. Now before we go on, I need to recognize very, uh, uh, four very important groups. First, we've formed a science circle uh, here at UCR. Uh, to try to reach out to engage the citizens of this community. We have a few of our uh, new, uh, newly minted uh, members of the Science Circle. I would like to thank them uh, publicly, and I hope that you will all thank them as well. The second is our Board of Advisors. We have a Dean's Board of Advisors for the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. These are, most of the people are alums of our college uh, who have gone on to do great and wonderful things. They volunteer their time to the college to help advise us uh, in uh, programs and uh, planning for the future. And so I think a good number of our board are sitting down here in the front. Would you please stand and, and let the group recognize you, please? Members of our board. There's some back in the back as well. Thank you very much. The third group I'd like to recognize are the high school students who have displayed their posters out here in the front. Are they out there now or have they come in? They had to leave, bummer. Well, that's too bad. But these kids really are remarkable. They were the winners of the um, science fair that was held here on the university campus back in February. Uh, and I had the joy of, of helping to hand out awards to some of these kids. And seeing the bright, enthusiastic uh, kids who are doing science today makes me feel very comfortable about the future of science in this country. And so they're not here, but thank you very much for coming. <laughs> and finally, I would like to recognize that group of people who are recognized far too infrequently, and that is the teachers of our kids in the schools of this country. Without science teachers, we in the university who teach science wouldn't have anything to do. It's a partnership involving the public school system, the public teachers, the science teachers, and the faculty at the university. Uh, it's a continuum all the way through the, the whole process. So we, I know we have some teachers here tonight. And I think you're down in here somewhere. Would you please stand up and let the crowd recognize you for what you do for us and for our kids? Thank you all so very much. Now, in spite of the good efforts of these teachers, in spite of the efforts of the faculty at the university, the American citizens are far too illiterate about science today. There's a real problem that we have that American citizens in general uh, define being well-educated as knowing a lot of history, philosophy, so on. These are important things, very important things. But science also is a critical part of a basic education of all citizens. What we're hoping to do by having this series of lectures is to start sharing with the public some of the fun, the excitement, the joy of modern science. Uh, I think what separates us as scientists from most uh, rank and file citizens really is the vocabulary that we use. Uh, the stuff isn't really that complicated, but we use words that are pretty much impenetrable. 
So as I've talked with the faculty who are going to be delivering the lectures here, what we've tried to do is to sort of scrub the language uh, so that we have, have chosen words that will be accessible to a well-educated lay public. Um, <clears throat> I think the problem that we're, we ha are facing with uh, science and literacy is really, to a very large extent, my fault and the fault of other practicing scientists, that for so many years we have done such a lousy job of explaining to you what we do. Hopefully we can do better than that. And I know that our first speaker can do better than that. Norm Elstrand uh, is a rec recognized authority in the flow of genes through plant populations, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about the dance of the genes. Norm? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm blown away by the audience. I mean, I'm really pleased. I can't say, though, that I'm totally surprised. On September 13th of this year, I'm going to be celebrating my 30 years in Riverside, the 30 of the best years of my life, and I've found that the people who live in Riverside are some of the most intelligent, wisest, and funnest people I have ever encountered in my life. So it's a thrill to have uh, all these old friends and new friends in the audience, and um, I'd like to take you through uh, 45 slides of a dance and the dance of the genes, uh, how biological evolution works. And in a sense, what we're going to see is that biological evolution, as it's defined by scientists, is a dance. It's a movement of genes over space and over time. So, so let's dance on <laughs> to the next slide. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about biological evolution, but the dictionary definition of evolution, which is pretty close to the scientific definition of evolution, is a gradual process by which something changes into a different form. Uh, at the end of this lecture series, we're going to have a talk on the evolution of the universe. Byram Abasher is going to be uh, talking about the first billion years, concentrating on the first five seconds of the universe. But today we're focusing on my area of research, biological evolution. Uh, specifically, I'm going to start with the definition, and it's really important to understand the definition because even many scientists don't, uh, who aren't in the area of evolutionary biology don't necessarily understand what biological evolution is all about. And because it's deeply ingrained in genes, I'm going to give you genetics 101 so that we're all at the same place with, uh, with our understanding of genetics. I'll briefly talk about the two areas of research in evolution nowadays, macroevolution and microevolution, concentrating on microevolution, my area, I'll go into the four evolutionary forces, mutation, chance, selection, and migration, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So if you, you like Google Images? I love Google Images. So you go to Google Images and you type in the word evolution and you see what you get. And so what you get are these sort of sequences of individuals, and some are, you know, evolving into gamers, and other are evolving into fish sticks, and these are, the, this is the common view of biological evolution. And I just leave these images with you and ask, are they really accurate? The definition of biological evolution is the change in gene frequencies in a population over time. So it's a genetic phenomenon, it has a population context, and it occurs over time. Those are the three elements of biological evolution. We have to step back to do a little bit of genetics, just to make sure that we all sort of understand what genetics is. All of the characteristics of all organisms, from hair color to body weight to, in my case, lactose intolerance, are determined by the genetic makeup of those individuals plus their environmental influences. So this idea of genotype plus the environmental context gives rise to the characteristics, and we call those characteristics phenotype. This is the, this is the basis of genetics and how it works and how it builds who we are. So uh, over in the lower left-hand corner, you see genotype and then arrows going to the various things that may uh, be environmental influences, diet, nutrition, lifestyle, 
um, toxic exposure, but many more things. Uh, how you're influenced as a child, whether you live someplace that's cold or hot, uh, you know, what you see on TV, it's, uh, birth order even is known to play an environmental component in how characteristics are expressed. So genotype and phenotype, these, these words that are highlighted in gold are going to be ones that I'm going to want you to think about and remember for, uh, through the talk. Okay, every, generally every cell in an organism contains two copies of every gene. One copy, okay, one copy from the organism's mother and one from the father. Um, now, the people who are sitting in the rows two, three, and four here have colored uh, picnic plates. And if you could raise the two copies of your genes up into the air, okay, we'll see that there's, this is my population here, and this is going to be an evolving population. We're at generation zero right now, and you'll see that it's more or less random, but there's a little bit of a concentration of, of blue over here. So this is, this is our population. Everybody's got two copies of their gene. Okay, you can pull those down now. Okay, genes are organized into chromosomes. Humans have about 35,000 genes, or at least that's what we believe right now. And then there's some pictures here with, with Gregor Mendel over on the side. The, the first picture shows the arrangement of chromosomes in a cell. The second picture shows what we call the human karyotype, the uh, 46 chromosomes, in this case, of a human male. The third picture shows uh, a congealed chromosome at the time of cell division. And the genes are arranged on those chromosomes. I'm just going to give you an example of how genetics works because we need to get back to um, evolution. Different forms of the same gene are called alleles. So if somebody held up, say, a blue picnic plate and a red picnic plate, they have two different alleles. If they held up two white picnic plates, they have the same allele, but they have two copies of alleles. Um, so what we probably all know best is the ABO blood system. Both my parents had the genotype AB, which means that they had an A allele and a B allele. My blood type is B, that means my genotype is BB. So I have two copies. One of the Bs came from my mom, one of the Bs came from my dad. I think you can, are convinced now that these are not really examples of biological evolution. What these pictures show is some sort of progressive change over time. So it's got the time component of evolution, but evolution doesn't have to be a progressive change. We don't really see anything here about genetics, and we certainly don't see anything here going on with populations. So as common as these views are, even creeping into the press enterprise ads for this lecture series, uh, these are not examples of biological evolution. Okay, so now it's time for generation one. Um, <clears throat> those of you who have, are, have picnic plates, I would like you to turn to your neighbor and exchange one of your picnic plates with somebody next to you. And what we are pretending is we are pretending we are an annual plant population. Each plant is mating with its neighbor. Each, because they're annuals, of course, each plant is then dying and being replaced with its with its baby. So just exchange one plate. Okay, hold your plates up in the air. Okay, now, has evolution occurred? How many say yes? Okay, how many say no? Okay, more people say no. And the reason that there is no evolution is because the frequency of the alleles has stayed the same. There's still the same number of blue plates in the audience, still the same number of red plates, and still the same number of white plates. So evolution hasn't occurred, although we've had an interesting mating incident here. <laughs> um, this is not going to be the lecture on history of evolutionary thought, but to just set a context, uh, People have observed that inherited traits can change in frequency from generation to generation. So ideas about evolution have been existing in human populations for thousands of years. And I would guess that perhaps the first people to think about this sort of 
change in inherited frequencies would be the Neolithic folks who domesticated animals and plants. So the first picture here I have is of a, of a wolf and the various dog breeds that are descended from wolves. And the second picture, I'm a plant scientist, so this is more exciting to me, is a picture of the um, fruiting body of the great-great-granddaddy of corn and the great-great-grandson or great-great-granddaughter, as it were, of, of the corn cob. So that string of black little seeds in the T. ascendi plant is the distant ancestor of uh, what we eat on the cob, with, sometimes with butter and lime juice. Um, the history of uh, evolutionary thought is going to be explored in more detail by Dave Risnick, who's in the third slide here. Okay. There's uh, currently, though, the evolutionary thought can be, or evolutionary study can be divided into two areas, uh, macroevolutionary studies, which are long-term, and microevolutionary studies that are short-term. <clears throat> Macroevolutionists typically work on a scale of hundreds to m many more than millions of generations. Uh, this area of macroevolution is sometimes called phylogenetics, and there will be a lecture on this long-term view of evolution or long-term study of evolution by my colleague uh, Nigel Hughes, who's seated drinking a beer underneath that Tetley's umbrella. Okay, but today we're going to talk about microevolution, very short-term evolutionary change. Oh, and that's me and an Aztec ball court. Okay. Uh, Microevolutionary scientists are excited about why and how populations come to differ genetically in space and time. So I had the structured population out here where there were more blue plates over here, and this is the sort of thing that microevolutionary scientists get excited about, is why is, are there non-random distributions of genes in space? Why is there more blue here? Well, actually, the reason there's more blue here is because we set it up that there's more blue here. Ah, historic constraint. Um, we work on the scale of at least a single generation up to a few hundred generations. And our work is on, focuses on the four evolutionary forces and their interactions. So as well as the evolution of the plastic plate population in this audience, we're also going to do an evolution of these corn populations here. We've got the smiling corn and we've got the shy corn, and we're going to see some evolutionary changes going on in those populations as well. Let's move on to the, the first of the four evolutionary forces. The first one is mutation. This is a spontaneous genetic change. So it's when um, an allele turns into something else. The uh, change is often due to a mutagenic chemical in the environment or radiation. So it's thought, for example, that gamma rays that come from outer space will shatter a chromosome or subtly alter an allele and cause that allele to have a different sort of effect. Um, it sometimes it's a fairly substantial change and it changes a chromosome. It's evolutionarily significant only if it occurs in the germline. So if you have a mutation such that you're like uh, one of my cousins who has a one eye that's blue and another eye that's blue and has a little segment of brown, that little segment of brown gene there is probably not going to find its way to her eggs or be passed on to her children. So it has to end up in a lineage of cells that gets passed on to children. Um, it, uh, it is fundamentally then the source of all genetic variation. The rates of uh, mutation are quite low. They're 10 to the negative fourth, which is like what, one in 10,000 to maybe one in 10 million per, one in uh, a million per gene per generation. But we know from studies of mutation that this varies with the species, it varies with the kind of gene, it varies with the environment, et cetera. Although we hear a lot about nasty mutations, it's thought by most evolutionary scientists who have looked at mutations that most of them have very little initial phenotypic effect one way or the other. So um, those of, we, we all have, on the average, uh, a few mutations that are different from our parents. Some people think it's four, some people think it's 10. But those mutations are not manifest in any large phenotypic changes. And by the way, I just mutated that smiley corn up there. Okay, so we are beginning to manipulate our populations. Okay. 
Okay, so keep, keep an eye on those corn populations because they will be changing. The most famous mutation in human history is perhaps a mutation that occurred in the cell line of, uh, of the eggs of Queen Victoria. And one of those cell lines um, that, uh, in, during her development resulted in an allele that causes uh, hemophilia. And hemophilia is a disease where, uh, if not properly treated, a person does not, a person's blood does not clot very easily at all. And in the days of Queen Victoria, individuals with hemophilia essentially had no treatment of clotting factor and often died before uh, age 20 or sometimes even age 15. Um, the allele for hemophilia, as you see, which is marked by the red, uh, red symbol in Queen Victoria was passed on to her offspring and increased in a frequency in a very special kind of population. So there was an allele change, a genetic change in the population of European royalty with the increase of the hemophilia allele. So you can see the individuals there that had hemophilia. One of the um, interesting results of the increase of hemophilia in the European royalty population was that the son of the Tsar had hemophilia at the time of the, um, at, at the early part of the 1900s. And uh, it so distracted the Tsarist family that the family was, uh, went to, to great lengths to try to find somebody who would cure their son. They found a uh, sl slightly crazy monk named Rasputin who would do it, but that person so distracted the family that, the, that all of Russia then became um, a sitting duck for Germany in World War I. And one could extrapolate a little bit by saying that the uh, allelic mutation in Queen Victoria gave rise to the Russian Revolution that gave rise to communism that molted the political history of the world in the 1900s. <laughs> and one could say that. Okay, there are other kinds of mutations that we're aware of. Uh, the Rex cat is a variety that has a very unusual hair structure. They are all descended from a single individual. Those of you who are into the X-Men saga can appreciate uh, those kinds of mutants or the mutant turtles. So mutation in itself has come into popular culture. I'm not sure those are real mutations, but nonetheless, we all have an idea of what mutations are. In a more practical way, I have to mention that there's a method called mutation breeding, where a plant breeder can actually use mutation to their advantage. And uh, so I have a picture here of the recently released Tango Mandarin from uh, UCR created by uh, Mike Roos's lab. And the Tango Mandarin is uh, virtually identical to the W. Mercot variety with the added bonus that it doesn't have any seeds. And this is a very popular variety and a um, very nice use of an evolutionary force in uh, a benefit to society. Oh, right, so it's time for Generation 2. Before Generation 2 happens, I have to go mutate some people. Okay, just think of me as a gamma ray. Um, okay, so will everybody in the audience please turn to somebody nearby you and exchange one paper plate. So we have a whole generation to generation change. This is very important for evolutionary biologists to go through a generation. Okay, we are in generation two and hold your plates in the air. Okay, now we've removed two whites, replaced two whites with two blues. Has the audience evolved? Yes, very good. Okay, we'll keep evolving. Um, the second evolutionary force is the force associated with chance. Uh, we call this genetic drift, and so I'll refer to it as genetic drift for the rest of the talk. There's, these are basically non-directed chance effects that alter allele frequencies. And as you might imagine, Genetic drift becomes more important as sampling error increases, generally as population size decreases. So uh, you know that you, you, 
of the chances of flipping a coin uh, and getting heads or tails are 50-50, but if you only flip it once, you're going to have a deviation from that average, right? So we might expect genetic drift to occur in chronically small populations, situations associated with a small number of founders starting a new population, a skewed sex ratio where a small number of males or a small number of females contributes genes to the next generation, or a population bottleneck where there's some sort of disaster, the population gets very small and then starts growing again. So a good example of a bottleneck would be that an unexpected volcano pops up in the middle of our corn patch there it has nothing to do with the genotypes, it just popped up there. It's a chance event. And we're left with one small smiley corn and one large smiley corn. Evolution did occur, by the way. Okay, sampling error. Just to sort of hammer home the, offense, uh, the effects of sampling error. Um, yes. I do this with my classes, too. These are California lottery tickets. Okay, they're all in order, and, it's a, and this is a small sample, right? So theoretically, it says here that there's one winner in every 4.8 lottery tickets, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lottery tickets here, and not one of them is a winner. Now, do I have to take these back to the California lottery and say, you promised me one in, you know, a little less than one in five. No, I, unfortunately, I can't do that. This is sampling error. It's a small sample. If I had bought 700 instead of seven tickets, maybe it would have worked. So that, that's a good way of sort of keeping track of what sampling error is all about. Um, founder effect is another situation like that where um, you have a large population and a small number of individuals go to start a new population, and those individuals just by chance may not represent the large population. So it's time for audience participation generation two plus, and I would like five individuals who have plastic plates to please come up on stage to be founders of a new population. Okay, there's, there's one person. Okay, this, there, these are individuals who were chosen by NASA to go to Mars, and they are founding the city called New Riverside. Okay, so let's, let's, count, how, uh, let's count the colors of their plates. Uh, we have a white, white, blue, red, blue, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Now, I know that the audience is one-third white, one-third red, and one-third blue, but without any other changes, if this population then started a new population, relative to the source population, the new population would evolve strictly by chance. That's genetic drift. Thank you so much. And congratulations on being the first citizens of New Riverside. I've got one more story because I think this is actually one of the most exciting stories about genetic drift there is. The island of Tristan da Cunha is the most isolated habited, inhabited place in the world. It is, um, you can see the little star in the South Atlantic, that's where it is. Uh, looking from air, you can see that it looks like a big volcano. And in fact, it is a big volcano sticking out of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And if you see the, the picture here on the side, you see a little flat area down at the bottom, and that's where the only city in, in uh, Tristan da Cunha occurs. It's called Edinburgh. Tristan da Cunha has its own website, I found out yesterday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And so I, all the data I collected here are from my prior talk on Tristan da Cunha, plus the newest news that there are now 264 people in Tristan da Cunha. Um, it's 440 square miles, so it's pretty small. Um, it is, 
Oh, and I forgot to tell you that the nearest big city is Cape Town, which is 1,750 miles away. So imagine living in Riverside, which is probably 440 square miles, give or take 10 or 20. Imagine living in Riverside with uh, 263 other people, and the next person is 1,750 miles away, sort of like you'd have to go to Seattle to see somebody else. That's pretty isolated. Um, Tristan de Kuna was settled in 1816 with 16 individuals. Um, now, you'd think that a small number of people would learn to get along, but uh, when it got up to 103, 33 people uh, got grumpy with the other ones, and they all left at once. Uh, population continued to grow till 1885. Um, you can see, up to this point, you can see that there are already two things contributing to genetic drift in this population. Uh, there's a chronically small population size, and very few families were founders. So you have a founder effect, you have the small population size. In 1885 came a bottleneck to the population as well. Tristan de Cunha, because it's a volcano, has no natural harbors. And so any boat that approaches Tristan de Cunha can't get very close. Nonetheless, for the inhabitants to survive and get the amenities of modern life in the 1800s, they had to have a boat come from Great Britain, and they were a dependency of Great Britain. So once a year, a ship would come down from Great Britain, but it couldn't get too close to the island. It would have to park off the island about a half mile or so. And the men of the island had built this big boat they called the lifeboat, and the lifeboat would go out, and the men would deliver sheep to the people on the, the big sailing ship in exchange for amenities like I don't know, medicine, cloth, nails, um, you know, comic books, whatever. Uh, in 18, so every, to, to get this to work, every able-bodied man who wasn't sick had to get into the boat and row out there dump off the sheep, pick up all the goodies, and row back to the island. And in 1885, they did that, and on their way back, a big wave came and tipped them over and killed them all. Um, Fifteen men died. These were the men of reproductive age on the islands. All the other men who were left on the island were either too young, too old, or too weird. Uh, and <laughs> This, this caused a lot of stress on the island. There were very few men who were able to reproduce. Uh, some of the families gave up and left the island. The population stabilized around uh, 1891, 59 individuals. And uh, the continued growth has brought it back up to 264 individuals yesterday. Over time, there were 34 immigrants to Tristan da Cunha from three different continents, four different continents, North America, Europe, Africa, and Asia, which is really a good genetic mix. Uh, but only 15 of those individuals actually contribute to today's gene pool. And so you can see that there's a great element of chance in the genetic constitution of Tristan da Cunha. When the island was evacuated, when the volcano was blowing up in the 1960s, those people came to Great Britain and they were encouraged to assimilate into Great Britain and most of them wanted to go back home. But during the time they were there, it was noted that they had certain genetic conditions which were different. Uh, we can imagine then that genetic drift must have played a role in these very unusual high frequencies of genetic conditions. 57% 50, of the people have genetically based asthma, and there's a whole research industry now of about 20 or 30 research papers based on the genetics of people in Tristan da Cunha to help us understand the genetic basis of asthma. 18% um, of the individuals were born with missing incisors. That's interesting. 14% of the population has full or partial deafness. And then, as you'd expect, by chance, some of the allele frequencies changed and other ones didn't. So many allele frequencies are not different from source populations. An example of this is the M and N blood type alleles, which are about the same as they are around the world, roughly 50-50. Nonetheless, the, um, these historical factors and the small sampling error have conspired to really make this a genetically rather uniform population. It's not all not only manifest in the phenotypes that we've talked about, but there's some information here. Uh, these final two comments 
give you an idea of just the tremendously low level of variation in the population. All the islanders are cousins. And on average, any two siblings, that is to say brother, 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 sister, 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 any two brothers are cousins according to 50 different pathways. So everybody's really related to everybody else. Furthermore, even though there are uh, there were about 15 last names that were introduced to the island over history. Only seven last names still survive. Going on to the third type of uh, evolutionary force, selection. Selection is defined as genetically based differences in reproductive success. And there are many kinds of selection. There's Directional selection, stabilizing selection, disruptive selection, balancing selection, frequency dependent selection, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to get into this, we can do two or three lectures on the different kinds of selection. I'm going to focus on two different kinds of selection because they make the point well about how selection works. I'm going to focus on directional selection. I'm going to focus on balancing selection. The idea of directional selection is Darwin's contribution to evolutionary theory. And it works like this. He observed that individuals in a population vary from one to another. You know, we don't, all don't look the same. And he also noticed that parents pass on some of their traits to their offspring. So we all look different, but our offspring all kind of sort of look like us, and they kind of sort of look like each other. So there's some genetic, this is, he didn't know genetics. Uh, he hadn't read Mendel's papers, which were, coming out at the same time, but were hard to get a hold of. So uh, this was his concept of heredity. And then he thought, well, what if some of those inherited traits enable individuals to leave more offspring than the average individual? Then those traits, if they have a genetic basis, if they are inherited, will be more frequently represented in the next generation. And if this happens, in a continuous fashion, then you would see certain frequencies increasing over time. That's directional selection. Um, I'd like to walk you through it a few different ways just to uh, illustrate some of the details of directional selection. We have a picture here of crows that I have a choice of green beetles and brown beetles, and crows are going, yum, green beetles, our favorite. And generations later, we see that the frequency of um, green beetles is beginning to decrease, and the crows are not eating the brown beetles. So the, uh, the brown alleles are, have a higher representation each generation. And eventually, the mixed population of green and brown beetles may end up being all brown beetles. So the environment favors a particular genetically based phenotype. So selection is working on the phenotypes that have a genetic basis, such that the phenotype's frequency and then the frequency of the contributing alleles increases over time. All, uh, we've already given you some examples of evolution that have occurred due to mutation, examples that have been observed with regards to genetic drift, uh, examples of directional selection occurring in populations over recent historic time, a uh, number in the hundreds. The two examples I give you here are um, the f frequency of mosquito species to evolve resistance to insecticides. So in the... Um, in the late 1940s, insecticides were introduced around the world for the purposes of controlling insects, and especially controlling diseases borne by those insects. And you can see that uh, at that time, once insecticides started being introduced, that there was an evolution in those populations of uh, f increased frequency of species that had evolved resistance, and the genetic basis of those resistances have been worked out. Mating studies have been done to show that the resistance uh, has a genetic basis. Sometimes when you release the, uh, the genetic pressure or the selection pressure by removing, say, DDT from a, uh, a population of insects, the DDT resistance goes away. Sometimes it doesn't. 
another example of selection is selection at the hand of man through domestication. We have the Brassica oleracea down here, a common wild mustard. You find this wild plant still growing on the uh, headlands around Mendocino, California. Um, and we know through intentional selection of different types that this wild plant has been selected for very different traits. So the kohlrabi is the same species, but the kohlrabi has been selected for a uh, thickened uh, bulb around the root and lower stem. Brussels sprouts, we know, have been selected for those uh, sprouts that we pull off the plant and eat. Cabbage is the same species, too. It's selected for those big leafy heads. Cauliflower has the white heads. Broccoli has those greenish florets, and kale we eat for the leaves. All of those are members of the same species, and just as different dog breeds have been domesticated, so have these different vegetables from a wild type. They all have genetically based traits. In this case, it's a human-mediated selection that's occurred, and there's been a directional change in their traits. So we're going to do a little directional selection on our corn populations now. Um, you'll remember that in the upper left-hand corner, the corn population had 50% uh, little ones and 50% big ones. It's raining. We have an environmental effect here. And now those little ones didn't like the, the very damp, cold weather, and they all died. Oops. Time for audience participation. Generation three. Um, hold up your plates, please. I have to do some directional selection. Uh, those individuals who are holding two white plates, I'm sorry to say you've died. Uh, <laughs> I, am, I am the environmental stressor, so please put your white plates underneath your, your chair and Unfortunately, the choreography doesn't allow me to uh, replenish your genotype at this time, but we're almost done, so it's okay. Okay, hold up the plates. Okay, everybody mate with a neighbor. Okay, for those of you who feel sorry for the white individuals who go extinct, you can, you can exchange, you can give them some plate, you know, give them your plates if you want to. But uh, the point, point is, is that let's look out over this population here. Okay, so has the, um, has the population evolved? Yes, and why has it evolved? White frequency has gone down. So change in allele frequencies over time, white frequency has gone down. By the way, does anybody have two whites now? Okay, so see, we reconstituted that genotype, even though in the prior generation the environment wiped that out. Okay, great. Let's go on to a different kind of selection, balancing selection. Uh, balancing selection the balancing selection story I'm going to tell you with uh, sickle cell anemia makes a lot of interesting points as well. Sickle cell anemia for the purposes of, or the sickle cell gene for the purposes of uh, our discussion, we'll call it the S allele and we'll call the common allele the A allele. Uh, the main, the difference between the S allele and the A allele is a single amino acid difference in the long protein that they create. But the single amino acid difference turns into a profound difference in the configuration of the protein, and it affects the ability of the protein to carry oxygen. And as we know, hemoglobin necessarily has to, you know, hemoglobin's job is to carry oxygen. And when there are low oxygen conditions, the um, hemoglobin, the S allele hemoglobin, tends to uh, configure itself into crystals, and with low oxygen, then you get these sickling blood cells here. Normal red blood cells look like donuts, and sickle cells look like little crescents. Um, so individuals that have two S alleles have severe anemia, and they, they rarely survive to uh, pass their teens. Individuals who are, have um, the AA allele, or rather combination of, of two A alleles or an A and an S allele, it turns out that um, they don't have the severe anemia. 
if malaria is present, individuals who have the AA allele are malaria intolerant and they suffer malaria pretty strongly, particularly if they are pregnant women or children. They tend to die of malaria at a very high rate. They have very severe symptoms. Individuals who have both one A allele and an S allele have a high degree of malaria tolerance. It turns out that the um, microorganism that causes malaria has trouble invading blood cells that have the S allele. So, in, so we find, if we do a map of where malaria is present in the old world, that's the green part of this map here, and we do a map of where the S allele is, we find a remarkable concordance between the S allele and the A allele. You can work out the selection that's going on here. It's selection, but it's not directional selection. There's selection against AAs because malaria is one of the world's most common diseases. It kills a million people a year. It's one of the top three. Um, so pressure from the disease malaria on the genetics of the populations is profound. So AA individuals uh, have problems, uh, th they have problems surviving, they have problems reproducing, they don't leave as many children. Likewise, the individuals who uh, have SS alleles, have severe anemia, they tend not to pass their genes on either. The individuals who are AS lead reasonably healthy lives in the presence of malaria, and they pass on more individuals. But is it evolution? If we look at this population over time and we just consider this population, it's not evolution because selection is working against the AAs and it's working against the SSs and the population would have a balanced maintenance of A and S alleles generation after generation. It couldn't move all to As and it couldn't move all to Ss. So here's an example of selection without evolution. So this is one kind of selection that can re results in no evolution. If you take the malaria away, then the relevant phenotypes with regards to health are simply anemia and no anemia. So there are a fraction of individuals in, uh, throughout the world, particularly where African populations have relocated, where there's a, a frequency of the S allele. The S allele, uh, individuals that have two copies of the S allele still have severe anemia. Now we have tests so that uh, family planning can be done for individuals who carry the S allele. Uh, the other individuals are more or less equally fit. It appears, for reasons that aren't clear to scientists yet, that individuals who have the A and the S allele still have a little bit of a fitness boost and have, have more children than those that don't. The point that I want to make here, though, is that selection, how selection works varies with the environment. If you add malaria, you have one kind of selection. If you subtract the malaria, you have another kind of selection. And even in different places around the world, selection works differently. So selection really depends on the environment. I'd like to summarize them with regards to selection. Selection depends on reproductive success, and that means it is not the survival of the fittest. Uh, mules are very fit animals. They are crosses between horses and donkeys, and they are stronger and longer lived and bigger and more macho than either a horse or donkey. But they are as sterile as a rock, and they can't pass on any genes, and, it, and so they have no reproductive success. They are as good as not being there, as good as dead with regards to uh, any evolutionary contributions. Uh, selection works on the phenotype. It depends on the environment. Um, as I just told, told you, I gave you an example of how selection works without evolution. And you know by prior examples that evolution can occur without natural selection. I want to give just a few words about adaptation. Uh, when selection works, there tends to be an evolution of the increased frequency of traits. So an organism, uh, a population, becomes increasingly better suited to surviving and reproducing in a population, uh, uh, reproducing in a given environment. So it's not surprising to find a moth that blends into the background of, of a, 
of the bark of a tree. It's not surprising to find cactus living in the desert. Um, it's not surprising to find that the interactions between a hummingbird and a plant and the co-evolution of them over time lead to illegal changes whereby the hummingbird gets a plant that it can see with a red flower, which an insects can't see red, and it also you know, selects for those plants that have a, a, a better fit for its, um, for its bill, so you get these long tubular flowers. And likewise, the, so you get this evolutionary, co-evolutionary match of allele frequencies moving in two populations in concert to, that end up increasing the fitness of both individuals. A hummingbird that suddenly has a mutation for a very short beak isn't going to do very well with this kind of Ipomopsis flower. Because adaptations are the result of the past directional selection, some traits are better suited for the past than they are for the present, and others simply may be good enough. Um, I'm going to leave adaptation to Marlene Zook, who's going to be talking about why doctors need Darwin, and uh, many of the topics she's going to be touching on deal with uh, past and present adaptations. Finally, my favorite topic, and what has uh, nourished my career for about 25 years here in Riverside, is the topic of gene flow, commonly called migration. It's allele frequency changes due to immigration of individuals or gametes. And so in human populations, we have immigration that occurs uh, because humans move from place to place, but some plants and animals aren't so lucky to have in individuals move. Instead, there's movement of spores and sperm, seeds, pollen, eggs, things like that. All of those individuals, uh, all of those propagules then can carry genes from one place to another. Uh, generally, it tends to uh, genetically homogenize populations. So let's do some gene flow between these two lonely populations here. And, oops, let's go back, right, okay. And you can see that this little bit of gene exchange between these populations now makes their allelic frequencies much more similar. Um, okay, so let's, yeah, uh, now typically when I do this in a class I have people throw paper, uh, f throw poker chips, but I really don't think we're set up to handle uh, flying paper plates at this time. Uh, but what I'd like to do is to have everybody hold up their plates for a second so I can sort of see the gene distributions here. Okay, yes. And I would like uh, the three people on this end to uh, mate with people all the way on that end. So I need some migration of individuals from one place to another. We're having long distance gene flow here. Okay, it's a little bit hard to do the accounting, but if I saw this, oh, by the way, right, now everybody has to mate with everybody else. No, 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 you, you're done mating. <laughs> you got one shot. <laughs> okay, okay, let's, let's hold those plates high. Okay, there's two, actually two kinds of gene flow have actually occurred here. One is the long distance gene flow that I, I did right now, that you'll remember there was a very high frequency of blue plates over here. So we had a substructured population. This side had a high frequency of blue. That had a very low frequency of blue. What happened with the long distance gene flow is the individuals on the end um, gave at least two blue plates down to the blue poor end of the spectrum here. But also, as you look across the room, hold the plates up a little longer, as you look across the room, you'll see that the high concentration of blue here has now permeated into the middle of the room, and that's through the short distance gene flow that's occurred generation by generation while you've been mating. So we've had two different kinds of gene flow going on here. Uh, so 
The population as a whole didn't evolve in this episode, but what we can say is that the frequency of blue in this subpopulation decreased due to gene flow, and the frequency in, of blue in that subpopulation increased due to gene flow. So we had a, a different kind of evolutionary dynamic here. There's another really exciting story about gene flow to give you another example, and this is the story of the Africanized bees, uh, also known as killer bees. Uh, the players in this story are the European honeybee, which is what we know as a domesticated bee. It's rel relatively docile. It really doesn't want to sting you unless it gets upset. Um, and these thrive in temperate climates. And these were domesticated by beekeepers over hundreds, of year hundreds and thousands of years in Europe. Uh, that's where our bee industry, basically honey industry, comes from. Uh, south of the Sahara is a different subspecies, subspecies of honeybee called the African honeybee. This is not domesticated, and it, grow, it builds its hives typically in logs. Um, the honey is harvested by humans who come and break the logs open and carry the honey away, or it's uh, harvested by... Uh, a weasel called a honey badger, which also has huge claws, and it just rips the log open. Th under this kind of uh, environment, you might expect that honeybees, to protect their resources, might not be so docile. And in fact, they're not. They're nasty. They uh, are known on occasion to uh, be so nasty that they kill individuals. They kill people, and they kill the other creatures that harvest honey from their logs. Uh, those honeybees that were docile, of course, would have been selected against long ago because people would have just uh, gone to those logs, harvested the honey, and those poor bees wouldn't have made it. So they grew, in, grew up in a very different sort of environment. Uh, and they, th they thrive in tropical climates. They do really, really well in moist, hot areas. So we can see the typical place where European domesticated bees live. They live in a man-made beehive. And we can see this uh, rather awesome and deadly looking uh, swarm of African bees from Africa. The um, picture in the lower left-hand corner is the beginning of our story. In the 1950s, Brazil was having a difficult time with honeybees. Part of the reason is, is that Brazil is a, um, is a hot tropical country, and there were small struggling hives of honeybees throughout Brazil, but people weren't doing very well. Honey production wasn't doing very well either, and a Brazilian scientist thought that if he could import some of those subspecies from Africa that do so well in the tropics to Brazil, he could be breed a better honeybee. So he brought some of these scary, nasty honeybees over to his research station, and he set up special hives with little guards that, keep, that would let the sterile workers in and out, but were small enough that they would keep the queens and the males inside the hive. So basically, there would be no worry about escape. Uh, turns out that one weekend somebody was taking a tour of his facility and he wasn't there and somebody else was managing things and the visitors were being shown the beehives. Um, the worker, the person working there giving the tour said, gosh, look at these things, you can't get, the queens can't get out of here, this is awful. And not knowing about the experiment removed all the guards. Seventeen queens escaped. Um, those 17 queens, in a story of both gene flow and directional selection, did very well in the hot tropical climate of Brazil. And those queens founded new colonies, and those queens went to where domesticated bees occurred as well, and they mated with the drones. They bumped out the females from the human hive, you know, human built hives. And the alleles associated with the nasty disposition and the awesome honey production spread uh, northward and southward through Brazil. The um, very strong selection pressure for the ability to live in, in these very damp, very hot climates, strong, uh, you know, they brought with them all kinds of genes for resistance to the diseases that would rot the, rot the hives and cause them havoc. Um, and recently, they've arrived in the United States, and we've heard about uh, African bees. But what, we, what they really are is Africanized bees. They are 
the genes, no longer the African bees themselves, but the genes, the alleles associated with being an African uh, be that have made their way through the American tropics and into North America. What we can expect to happen in North America is the same thing that happened in southern Brazil. As the bees began to go south into the cooler climates, beekeepers found that it was relatively easy to dress up in these moon suits and start selecting for those bees that had the high honey production but were not, uh, not too nasty. And the, the cooler climate of southern Brazil also helped knock those types out. So the experiment actually ended up being successful. Farmers in southern Brazil, the cooler area, have been able to incorporate what they find desirable in the African genes, the ability to work in a warm climate, the ability to produce a lot more honey, and they've doubled and tripled their honey production, and they have selected out the nasty genes. And we can expect that beekeepers in the United States, if they follow a similar strategy, will probably do the same. Nonetheless, it is a dramatic story of gene flow, of genes moving you know, from 1950 to 2009 across two continents into North America. So that patchwork there is the most recent map of counties that have bees with African traits in, uh, in North America. So uh, just two years ago, Florida wasn't on the map at all. Two years ago, uh, the map hit, went to Riverside County, but it didn't go any further north. So these genes are moving, and um, it'll be an, it's an interesting natural experiment, gene flow in action. That more or less wraps up my talk. I've defined biological evolution for you. It might be a, a different definition or it might be the definition that you already knew. Uh, a quick course in genetics, the difference between macro and micro evolution, the four evolutionary forces. Mutation, which adds variation to populations. Chance effects that uh, change allele frequencies simply due to chance, whether you're on Tristan de Kuna or a citizen of New Riverside. Selection, <clears throat> two examples of selection, directional selection, the kind of selection that Darwin came up with, progressive change in allele frequencies over time due to environmental force, and balancing selection, the fascinating story of uh, the sickling genes and uh, hemoglobin. Migration, gene flow, my area of research that I do on, on plants, and I, before we open it up to Q&A, I have to, uh, give a little glimpse into the future of the series. Marlene Zook speaking two weeks from today, Dave Resnick speaking four weeks from today, then Nigel Hughes wrapping up with uh, Byron Mobasher. And thanks. I wouldn't have been here in, uh, for 30 years in Riverside if it wasn't for a group of wonderful people and institutions that supported me. Uh, I want to thank UCR for uh, being just the fabulous place to come to, the Ag Experiment Station and the great resources to allow me to do research I could explain to my parents. Uh, nothing like doing applied research. Uh, my two favorite supporters my, uh, and my favorite scientist, Tracy Kahn, uh, my spouse, and my son, my favorite social scientist now at UC Santa Cruz. Funding from uh, <clears throat> a variety of sources, from Fulbright to the National Science Foundation. Yeah, and I have to thank all the members of Team Elstrand, um, and these are all the ones I could fit reasonably on the slide. And finally, in the lower right-hand corner, Wild Radish, uh, of my 150 publications, about 50 of them are on this plant that kept me from working at McDonald's. So I look forward to uh, your questions. Thanks a lot. Questions? Go for it. Uh, the question is, there's been research on corn and UCR, and did I play a role in it? Okay, with regard to the protein aspect. No, I didn't do the 
protein research. That would be Dan Galley, and I don't know, is he here tonight? I mean, that is really, some really awesome stuff, but um, no, I've done, I've done other research on corn, and uh, mostly on the mating relationships between the wild uh, relative in Mexico, Tia and uh, that you saw there with the, the funky seeds. Question way in the back. What are genes made of? That's a really good question. That's a wonderful question. Genes are made of a chemical that's called DNA, and DNA is organized in such a way that it, you can read it like a book. And our bodies, our cells, are capable of reading the DNA like a book, and they take that information, and they build our bodies out of that information. Is that, is that a good answer? Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, islands are good systems for that. One of the stories that hasn't been explored real well but is uh, significant in the United States is Martha's Vineyard. Until Martha's Vineyard was well-connected uh, transportation-wise with the mainland of Massachusetts, uh, when about 90% of the population spontaneously knew American Sign Language because such a high fraction of people were deaf due to, due to a genetic uh, condition in Martha's Vineyard. So small islands are definitely the case. There's about a half million people who live in Iceland, so I'm not, I'm not sure I know any details about Iceland. Other isolated populations that have interesting genetics are those where uh, there are populations that regulate their own mating patterns, of, I mean human populations. So. Um, there was a postdoc in my lab who was a Brahmin, and he was very interested in Brahmin genealogies, and there's some really fascinating research that's gone on with regards to um, keeping track of alleles of, of Brahmins in India. Um, so he was from southern India, and interestingly, he had the, you know, the, the, same phen the same skin phenotype of people in southern India, which is very dark, but uh, it turns out that that Brahmins tend to be, regardless of their skin type or where they are in India, they tend to be all more closely related to one another than they do to the other castes. Uh, likewise, certain religious groups in the United States uh, encourage mating within, uh, within the religious group, and those groups are often very open to scientists to provide information about their genetics because those small groups then tend to have high frequencies of, of genetic conditions that cause some sort of problem. And, um, there are fa fabulous genealogies available in North America. Uh, Norm, over here. Oh, okay. Oh, hi. Thanks very much. That was terrific. Um, getting back to your isolated island, whose name I forget, in the South Atlantic, presuming those people, there's no further migration, and presuming uh, usual mutation rates and so on, how long will it be? Can you cast into the future? How long will it be before those humans uh, will be their own species and unable to mate with other humans. Thanks, Alan. That's a very provocative question, and <laughs> uh, the topic of speciation is going to be part of Dave Resnick's talk, so I will speculate minimally about this. We know that uh, we know that some isolated populations over time do build up uh, differences that reduce the ability to reproduce. I would think human populations would do that relatively slowly because our generation times are just so long. So um, I'd just say a long time. <laughs> okay, there was a question down here in front though. Yes? Um, okay, this was a really good question. The question was, um, some mutations come from, uh, it, it's known that some mutations come from the problems of uh, genes being unable to replicate themselves exactly. 
And the question was, was that in conflict with what I had said? No, actually, uh, I think, I mean, I think your, your point is well taken, is that there are mistakes in uh, copying of genetics, and I should, uh, of, of one DNA set to another DNA set, and I should have included that. Typically, uh, those, you know, those m mistakes may have some external cause or they may have an internal cause of, you know, the Xerox machine just doesn't work properly. Okay, so those mistakes are still considered mutations? Those would still be considered mutations. Okay. Any spontaneous genetic change. So I just, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, yes, uh, you, you mentioned that survival of the most prolific is the general outcome, not survival of the fittest. So do we have an argument in favor of a new department of genetic uh, selection? Uh, and is this the sort of thing that gets geneticists in trouble like Shockley 20 years ago? Let's see. I, I, th I think that uh, the... The fir I mean, the first thing is, is that, yes, it is, uh, selection works on the ability to pass on genes to the future generation. So, yes, it's not, survive it's, um, uh, not survival of the fittest, but it is the, you have to survive to reproduce, okay? So, definitely, it, su survival of the most prolific is sort of a cool phrase. I hadn't thought of that before. Then the other question was, how does this relate to the theories of Shockley in the 1960s, 70s, I think it was, um, who felt that there was variation in the, uh, there was variation in human population. He was mostly concentrating on what IQ and saying that those were related to, that was correlated with human races. And I believe that most of that research has been discounted now um, for a variety of reasons, one of which is, is that IQ is now perceived to be a multifaceted thing, uh, that, uh, mul that the people who make IQ tests have to be very careful that they don't add cultural biases to the IQ, that there are, um, there's, a, there's a whole list of things. Probably the biggest thing that, that sort of kicked the, kicked the IQ Q thing down for a while was the discovery that Sir Cyril Burke, who had done the IQ, uh, the IQ twin studies during the 1950s and 60s, after after he died, it revealed that his data was totally fraudulent, and people had to start all over again. Okay, um, I don't know what finally happened with James Watson, and uh, uh, the discussion of James Watson and what he said and what the social implications are, are worthy of sitting around a table drinking beer because there's lots to say, and he's a very colorful individual. Uh, I, 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 I think you're, uh, you are correct that he was, um, he was let go by the board of his position. He wasn't at a university, though. He was at a research institute, but I just can't remember the research institute off the top of my head. Cold Spring Harbor. Absolutely. I don't disagree with you at all. I think that the... Uh, I think that there are lots of areas of research, and I think that it's, um, uh, it's important to take the facts and to examine what they say and to do it without, without bias. You know, I mean, we're all biased, but try to, try to check our bias at the door when we collect our data. Absolutely. All right. So. What do you enjoy most about the research you do, and how fast would you say the technology is advancing in the research you do? Okay, the research I do with regards to um, gene flow in plants is tremendously interesting because I had done it for a number of years outside of the applied context, but here at UCR we're encouraged to do something that's applied. And it occurred to me in the late 1980s that one of the applications of gene flow, long distance mating, if you will, in plants, is that this gives an opportunity for engineered genes to move where they might not want to go, where we may not want them to go. 
So what's most fun for me has been the opportunity to get involved in discussions of science informing public policy. And I've taken, I've gone on the road, I've met with uh, NGOs, uh, companies, governments, and in venues asking questions about the safety of genetically engineered plants. They, the policy makers, the people who are not scientists, ask fabulous questions about science. And they'll ask me something and, you know, you'll be sitting at a workshop or something and we'll say, what do we know about X? And it's like, oh my gosh, this is a wonderful question that nobody's ever asked before. So a lot of my research is driven by these interactions with people who are non-scientists who ask fabulous research questions. So to me, that's the, uh, that's the greatest thrill is always learning something new. Um, when, you know, whenever I think I know it all, I look at some research results and Mother Nature, you know, kicks me in the guts and tells me, you know, don't be silly. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the, it's be, the world just unfolds before me and there's just always surprising answers and it's just great to let the science lead. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. There's a question right up here in front. Okay, so the question is that evolution, I guess you're saying the idea of evolution or the philosophical idea of evolution could remove the dependency on a God, well, sorry. Okay, right, that, that the, uh, the, fa the, I mean, evolution as I've described it here is, is fairly well defined. So the question then is, does that as, uh, you know, uh, does that concept challenge spirituality? And I can tell you as far as I'm concerned, it, uh, you know, this is a personal view. It hasn't challenged my spirituality. In the 30 years I've been in Riverside, if anything, I've become much more of a spiritual individual. And I feel that the, um, feel that the information that I gather as a, as a scientist and my spiritual life overlap, but they are not the same thing. I think I can have what I believe, and I can have what I observe, and at some points they overlap, and other points they don't. It, to, to me, there is no personal challenge. But I, I think, thank you for raising the issue. Uh, the, the point is well made uh, that microorganisms, viruses, and bacteria in particular have a single copy of genes and they don't have two copies of genes. So uh, the reason that I raised the issue of two copies of genes and just, I just wanted to make the genetics class as simple as possible here because we have two copies of genes. Uh, but you're absolutely right, there are th thousands, millions of species that have a single copy of genes. They all uh, are subject to evolutionary change as well. Um, so we, I'm the most, uh, the greatest evolutionary change that's in our face in a microbe population right now is MRSA, multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, that has evolved because of strong use of antibiotics in human populations, and it's a very difficult d disease to, uh, uh, to cure. Uh, there are, I, I think, methicillin is used now to, to cure it, but this particular bacteria has picked up the has picked up alleles uh, over ev over a very short evolutionary time, although it's thousands of generations for the bacterium. That the strong use of antibiotics has uh, rendered this bacteria resistant to penicillin, erythromycin, all the common ones. Well, Question in the back. Um, I think that the, okay, this is, I have a 90-minute lecture on this. Uh, 
The, um, one of the primary issues that's been raised about genetically engineered crops is whether or not the, uh, the pollen will, will pollinate plants that it's not supposed to pollinate. So the genetically engineered cotton is an excellent example of this, is that we have genetically engineered cotton that has resistance to, a, uh, uh, to insects. It's called BT cotton, and um, it's resistant to bollworms and other lepidopterans. Cotton in the United States is uh, grown in every state except where there are wild relatives of cotton. And EPA forbids it from being grown in southern Florida and Hawaii because EPA is re reluctant to let those genes for insect resistant get into wild populations where it might influence the relationship of the wild population to uh, the insects. Uh, so that's basically where we stand right now. The, um, for, uh, again, for the most, I mean, for the most part, what's happened with engineered genes ending up out of place, and I don't want to say, you know, doing something nasty, but ending up out of place is that we've learned a lot about how hard it is for, to keep crop genes where they're supposed to be, and these happen with traditional crops as well. It's just with these engineered genes, they're so novel, we can use the new technology to, to show where they go. And it's shown us, uh, it's given us some important lessons that if there were something that we didn't want to get out, for and an example of this is, is that there were people who were genetically engineering corn uh, up till just a few years ago with uh, creating pharmaceutical compounds that if it got into the food supply, it would make people sick. And there's been a radical change in that policy to prevent that from happening now. Question? Norm has been standing up here for almost an hour and a half. So can we take one more question right here and, and then let's let him sit down, please. Okay, so you're talking about what is the most common genetically based disease in humans? Um, it's, a it's a little bit uh, controversial, but there is a disease, and I'm not a human geneticist, okay, so, so I could be saying absolutely the wrong thing here, but there is a disease associated with iron accumulation, hyper iron accumulation, and it had, I mean, now we call it a disease because it's it's predicted, it's, it's been detected at a high frequency in our population in North America. One of the reasons that's been detected is because there's been an environmental change. Why do you think in the last 20 years we've seen the rise of people getting sick from accumulating too much iron in their bodies? People are taking vitamins. People are taking vitamins like never before. And so very high intake of, of iron in a form that we can accumulate it in our bodies, and it turns out that there's allelic variation in, in the human populations in North America to hyperaccumulate iron. Now that probably was a good thing for those populations a few thousand years ago when people didn't have vitamins and they needed to have the extra iron. But now it actually, because of the change in environment, it turns into a, a new condition, and if this isn't caught, um, then it can really damage organs around, it's typically first noticed when people reach their late 40s or early 50s, and if it isn't dealt with relatively rapidly, people have da very damaged organs by age 60. So originally in North America, one would have said that uh, cystic fibrosis was the most common uh, genetic condition that would cause people hardship, but it looks like this new iron accumulation disease uh, is moving, it has, has supplanted that as being the most common, certainly not, not as devastating, but still a bad disease. Well, I would like to thank you all very much for coming. Let's thank Norm for a great talk.